Let's start with singing the chorus. God of wonders beyond our doubt You are the Lord. Oh, universe declares your majesty. You are the same that we pray to that God would reveal his heart to us today okay, that's our prayer for tonight Everyone needs compassion, love that's never fading, let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, kindness of the Savior. The whole world needs Savior, He can move the mountains to 
My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save. Forever, author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. So take me as you find me, all my fears and failures, fill my life again, live my life to follow, everything I believe in, now I surrender. Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save. And the author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Savior, He can move the mountain. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever, author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come to your presence this evening, help us, O Lord, to understand your word. Help us, O Lord, to understand your revelation, that we may truly be transformed from within. When you are the Savior, you are the one who sustains us. Scripture says that you are the author of our salvation. You started it. You fulfilled it. You completed it. Father, everything that the Father demanded, Jesus gave at the cross. And it satisfied the demands of the Father. We are saved because of what you did on the cross for us. Help us to be thankful for this grace. Help us to be thankful for everything that we received from you. And this evening, we thank you for what you're going to give us. In Jesus' name. So welcome once again to this evening Bible study. And today I want to actually take you through, last week we had the four stories. Today I want to take you through one big story again. Right. So before we go into the story, some little things that I want to share. We've been, uh, I'll, I'll share the PPT with you so that you'll be able to follow it okay, with the PPT. Okay, we're looking at God's grace on Tuesday evenings through the grassroots Bible study. We are, we are looking at God's grace. How this grace is risky is what we saw the last few weeks and uh, why we need to share grace, which is risky. And we saw from uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones and uh, many other you know, people how they said that our preaching is not complete if we don't share about grace. And we also saw that during the Reformation, you know, uh, Martin Luther and his people, all of them, the reformers, they held on to this by grace alone. So grace has something 
so much to do with God's salvation. And that's what we're going to focus on today. Today we're going to say how grace is undeserving, but unconditionally. But we are unconditionally loved. We are totally undeserving of his grace, but we are also unconditionally loved. And the passage I would like to focus is, of course, 1 Corinthians 15, 9 to 11, what Paul says about himself. But at the same time, we also look at an Old Testament story, an Old Testament event, actually, Old Testament event, historical event, which actually took place. And uh, we don't really hear the story in Sunday schools, and we ought to be hearing it more and more. Okay, I'll be sharing the story later on. All right, let's go into today's study of God's undeserving grace. But we are also unconditionally loved. Now, when people say grace, you know, they say, you know, when, when I'm with my family and I say, okay, let's say grace. It's usually just before dinner or you know, lunch or breakfast. When we get together, we say, okay, let's say grace and then let's eat. So we say a quick prayer just before food, consumption of food. And that is to us saying grace, right? Saying grace before food. But the, the grace that the Bible speaks about is far greater than that. It is not a formality before lunch or dinner. It is something much more deeper than that. And that's what we are going to focus on today. How grace is something far more than what we can ever imagine. John Newton was the man who was actually originally a slave trader. And he was convicted in his heart by the Holy Spirit. And he was saved by Jesus. And he's the one who wrote this famous hymn, Amazing Grace. This happened in the 18th century, 1725 to 1807 is when he lived. So in the words of that hymn that he wrote, he was actually picturing himself. He was looking at his own past life as a slave trader, a wretched man that he was. And then he was looking back at his old life and singing from his new life. The new life that he had found in Jesus, the new life where Jesus had pardoned him and unconditional love was overflown into his, you know, into his life. And he experienced this grace in his life. And that's when he wrote the song, his amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. I was blind, but now I see. And there was this man, you know, I, I was reading his uh, uh, biography. He's a man who lived in the, nine, he died in, I think, 1959. Okay. He, he was one of the founders of, I think, uh, uh, Fuller Theological Seminary or Dallas Theological Seminary. I, I don't know which, I don't remember which one it was. His name is Louis Schaffer. Okay. Louis Schaffer, L-E-W-I-S-C-H-A-F-E-R, Louis Schaffer. And uh, he, this man, you know, uh, he was taking lectures in his theological seminary. And one of his favorite subjects was grace. And he preached so extensively and so exhaustingly you know, from grace. He still had more to preach. On his last session, he stopped for almost 35 to 40 years of his life. He was teaching in the seminary. And on his last sermon, uh, on his last class, he turned to the people, you know, he, he, that, that was also on grace. Okay? Last message was on grace. And he said, as a closing session, you know, last two lines he said was, half my life, okay, more than half my life, I have been studying this truth called grace, God's grace. And now I know this is my last session, but in my last session, I just want to tell you, at this moment in my life, he's, he's grand old, okay, he's saying, uh, after, he's, after he preached this message, after three months, he's going to die. So in 1959, he's making the statement. He's saying, half my life I have preached on the subject called, I have studied this subject called truth. And only now, at the end of my life, I'm beginning to understand even a little bit of what grace actually is. That's how deep and wide God's grace is. No? So we are here to discover all about God's grace. What is it all about? We can't even know it fully through this lifetime. We'll need eternity to find out what exactly is grace. But we're going to try a little bit today. Okay. So again, something that John Newton said, I'm not the man I ought to be. I'm not the man I wish to be. And I'm not the man I hope to be. But by the grace of God, I'm not the man I used to be. Okay. What is he? 
He was earlier a slave trader. He was a wretched man. He was a wretched sinner. And now he says, by the grace of God, I'm not the man I used to be. I'm not the man I ought to be. I'm not the man I wish to be. And I'm not the man I hope to be. But by the grace of God, I'm not the man I used to be. We are not perfect. We are sinners saved by grace. And we are continuing in many sins. You know, till the day we die, there will be sin in our lives. But by the grace of God, I'm not the man I used to be. You're not the person you used to be. I'm not the person I used to be. That's what grace does. It changes us. It makes us a new creation. And we are not the people that we used to be. Now let's go into Paul's statement that he makes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 9 to 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 9 to 11. He says, for I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. That is what he was before, you know, when he was Saul. And he took, uh, you know, uh, letters from the priests and, you know, he went and uh, hunted the people they called in the way. They called the Christians the people who followed the way. So they persecuted the Christians and they brought them, threw them out of their homes, put them in public places and they stoned them to death. Okay. So this was mob violence. Paul was the man supervising the deaths of the Christians. He was the man authorized by the religious folks to persecute the Christians. And he said, because I persecuted the church of God, I'm the least of the apostles. I'm unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church. Then he says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. See, he's not the man he used to be. He's not a persecutor anymore. But now, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. God did not show it to me. You know, God did not give me grace in, in vain. No. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. Any of them means any of the apostles. I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I. See, does he claim any, any accomplishment? Is he, does he say that he is greater than the others? No. But the grace of God that is with me. So he's giving credit to God and his grace. Because of where he has reached and what he has done, all the hard work that he's put in, it's not his achievement. It is the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they. So we preach and so you believed. So what do you see here? You see Paul making this great statement. Whatever Paul had become, he was owing it all to the grace of God. So from this passage, we are able to understand uh, you know, three things. You're able to understand three things. The first one is that God does what he does by his grace. God does what he does by his grace. This is the events that, these are the events that are listed about Paul's life. You know, his birth was approximately in AD 10. These are all, uh, you know, inferred from the texts of the Bible. Okay. So uh, he was, he, he grew up in Tarsus as a follower, uh, as a student of, uh, as a disciple of Gamaliel. And then his conversion happened on the road to Damascus, 34 to 35 AD. Then he spends three years in Arabia. Galatians 1.17 tells us that. Then his first visit to Jerusalem after his conversion, uh, approximately AD 37. And then he writes 1 Thessalonians, AD 49 to 50. Encounters Gallio in Corinth, Acts 18, chapter 12 to 17 in 50, AD 50, AD 51. Then the Jerusalem conference of Acts chapter 15, that happens during AD 50, 51 again. And in Ephesus, he writes Galatians, 1 Corinthians, Philemon, Philippians, all those in AD 53, 55. And then again in Corinth, he writes Romans. And uh, when he's in prison, he writes the, the last few letters, the pastoral letters and all of them. Okay? And he writes Romans. And then he's executed by Rome around 62 to 65 AD. So this is his lifeline. Okay? This is... This is the timeline of Paul's life. And he, say, he says, he looks back and he says, God does what he does by his grace. Okay. Being, uh, you know, uh, he was allowed to live even after he had persecuted the church. God allowed him to live. That itself is God's grace. And he was used as a spokesperson for God. He was a blasphemer earlier. He was persecuting the church. And he was, what was he actually deserving because of his persecution of the church? God actually needed, you know, to punish him. 
the uh, strictest judgment had to be passed on, on, on Paul. Okay? But God was gracious and he allowed him to live after that. And he, became, he chose him as a spokesperson for him. And then he also made him a leader. And he sent him out to witness to the Gentiles. Now he says all these things were by his grace. So God does what he does by his grace. If you were to give Paul what he justly deserves, he should have been brutally killed or punished. No? He should have been severely punished. But that is not what God gave him. God gave him grace instead. That's what Paul is saying. God does what he does by his grace. And then he says, I am who I am by the grace of God. I am who I am by the grace of God. He says, nothing is my self-achievement. There are no accomplishments. You know, uh, Paul was not building his own church. He was building the church of Christ. You know, Christ's body. That is what he was building. He did not build his own ego-centered kingdom. And he said, okay, you know, I, I am the boss here. You know, I make the doctrines. I give you these books, so I, I should be given some credit. He's not taking any credit. He says, I am who I am by the grace of God. Then, so because God does whatever he does out of grace, and because I am who I am by the grace of God, we have to come to this third conclusion. I allow you to be who you are by the grace of God. By the grace of God. See, grace is not something to be claimed. Grace is something to be demonstrated. If Paul has received grace being a blasphemer at one point of time, God showed him grace and made him whoever he is right now. Paul is saying, I must demonstrate the same grace to you all. I must give the same grace to you all. Grace is something to be demonstrated. It is not something to be claimed. It is something to be shared. It is something to sustain relationships. It is not something... To just claim and say, okay, I need grace, but, but will I give others grace? No, 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 I will not give anybody else grace. That is, not the, that is not the right attitude. If you have received grace, if I have received grace, we are responsible to give out grace, to demonstrate grace, to share grace, and to sustain relationships. No. I remember watching a cartoon once. There are two guys you know, in that cartoon. I remember one is an aggressive person. And the other one is a very passive, very mild person. Okay, so the aggressive person is making a statement to the young, the the mild, meek person. Okay, he's saying, if you know, he he looks at something around the world and he sees, sees all this corruption and all those things, and he says, you know, if I were in charge of the world, I would have changed everything. I would change everything. You know, I would change the system of corruption. I would change that. I would change this. I would change everything. The world is not going the right way. If I was in charge, I would change everything. And the other guy, you know, the friend who was meek, he said, you know, that's not going to be easy. Changing the whole world is not going to be easy. You know? Where are you going to start? And this fellow, the aggressive fellow, you know, he looks at this meek fellow. He asked him the question, where, do, where are you going to start? You know, the whole world, changing the whole world is not easy. It's a big task. The whole world is so big. So where are you going to start? And immediately this fellow, this tough guy, the aggressive guy, looks at the meek fellow and says, I think I'll start with you. I think I'm going to start with you. Okay? Because I see that you have many things that are wrong. And if I want to change the world, let me first start with you. So he's not going to give this friend his grace. Okay? No grace for you. That's what we call grace killers. People who are not willing to give grace to others, we call grace killers. So you need to change. And I'm going to start with you. That's how a grace killer speaks. That's how a grace killer does not demonstrate grace. All right. So this is the picture that people have of Father God in their hearts. Many of them have that. You know? This is by a painter, a famous painter. But I'm just saying the angry God image is what we carry in our hearts. Waiting to confront us. You know, God is always folding his arms and looking at us in a suspicious nature. Always trying to find fault with us. Hey, hey, what are the people? You would have, you know, you would have slipped by. You know, so he is determined to find some weakness or flaw in us so that he can punish us. The angry God image. There are some friends that we have like that also, right? Some Christian friends. They will not see 20 things that you have done correctly. 100 things that you had spoken or did, you know, very well. 
but they will find that one flaw and they'll pounce upon him they'll jump up on him and they'll say i i won't praise you but i will always be there to correct you see? that's what jesus was saying you know when you're saying about that plank in your own eye and the speck in your friend's eye those people have only one goal and what is that one goal i will expose your one flaw and that's the main goal of my life that's what grace killers do they will not see or appreciate the 20 things that you've done well but they will look at that one flaw and highlight it they'll say i will not let you forget it all your life i will keep on reminding you one flaw one flaw one flaw i had this uh, teacher who was teaching me in my travel field you know his um he's a very good teacher and uh, he was running one of the most successful institutions in swandrum at that point of time and when i joined this course i found out that you know if if you're on his good side if you win his favor then you can get any job in the industry okay if you want an airlines job that's a dream of everyone every travel agent you get an airlines job your life is made but for that you have to be on the good books of this person so when you're doing this this course only for 3 months when you're doing this 3 months you're always aware that his eyes are watching you even if he's not watching you you think that your his eyes are always watching you. so t- during this uh, you know 3 uh, months we behave our best we behave very decently and we try to impress this man somehow or the other and it so happens that by the end of this 3 months you know there is a a trip that they take you you know a, a tour a, a, a sort of a you know excursion that they take you and the whole uh, tour the whole uh, excursion is actually to check whether you have understood the concepts of travel because that's a course we are doing we're doing a course on traveling so traveling and ticketing so they evaluate you on the basis of that so i went with this for this trip and in this trip they will uh, the uh, the the master will actually entrust you with different responsibilities a group is responsible for food the another group is uh, responsible for arranging the travel another group is uh, you know responsible for arranging the uh, accommodation there different different groups are given different assignments i was in charge of food and you know every time i uh, you know uh, stop at some place to arrange food i have to find out what each person wants and arrange the food with the uh, hotel you know, restaurant and i i'm like doing the best that i can so that i don't want to have the best food i don't want them also to have the best food but my impression that i want to make is on the master on the sir i want him to him to see that you know i am doing a great job arranging food for everybody you know at the end of the tour we came back and you know there was an evaluation round and guess what he said he did not say even what word appreciative of anybody the travel you know he poor, he showed us all the flaws that there there was in the travel and they showed all the flaws that were in the accommodation and he told us all our flaws you know when we were arranging the food he said the food was lousy that was not good this was not good this fellow didn't get anything that was we found out all the flaws and we were like is there any word of appreciation no no word of appreciation that's how the world is no and some people say okay live with it that's how you have to you have to take rejection you have to take you know people's negative criticism of you but the same thing applies among christian fellowships people pounce upon you and they say like you know it's like god is evaluating you and they are also evaluating you and in their evaluation they will say you got a c minus you got an f you got a d plus you know and they'll see like aren't you ashamed of yourself you should be you know say not bad you you did not do very bad but you can do much better than this that's the way christians evaluate christians they won't say anything good about it but they will be graded and you will be put down this is not building each other up this is actually tearing each other down so whom do we worship do we worship this angry god the god who is mad at us god who is irritated with us all the time folding his hands and om wrath 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 judgment 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 this is the kind of god that we serve the truth of the matter that the gospel teaches us is that when jesus was hanging there on the cross when he died on the cross the wrath of god was poured out upon him and the the wrath of god was satisfied okay so jesus is death on the cross satisfied the wrath of god okay so jesus was brought back from the dead 
because God's rock was satisfied. Now, if the father is satisfied with the son's full payment of, you know, of uh, ransom for our sin, if the atonement for our sin is completely paid and God's wrath is appeased, our sin has been fully paid for and God is 100% satisfied with the sacrifice that the son made, then in Jesus Christ, in his son, by grace, through faith, we are there. We are there. So, if he's satisfied with Jesus and his sacrifice, then he is satisfied with you and me. No more wrath towards you. No more wrath towards me. Why? Because it has been shown to Jesus on the cross. So, he doesn't have to show any more wrath to me. You get the point? So, I can be completely at peace with myself because God does not want to show his wrath to me. Instead, he wants to show grace to me. The same way how he looks at Jesus is the way now he looks at me if I am in Christ. He accepts, accepts me as I am and he treats me just like how he treats Jesus. That's what Jesus did on the cross for us. That's what he won for us. That's what he, his death on the cross achieved for us. You see? I'll share this one more event from Elizabeth Elliot. You know? She writes this book called the liberty of obedience. In that you'll find this, uh, you know, this story about a young man. This young man is so eager to forsake everything to follow Christ slow, you know, closely. So what is he? She says, uh, what must I forsake? He asks himself this question. Okay? What should I give up for following Christ? And then he comes to these conclusions. Actually, somebody speaks to him and tells him all this. Okay? He says, colored clothes, I have to give up. And in my wardrobe, there will be only whites. And I should stop sleeping on a soft pillow. I should stop sleeping on a soft pillow. Which means either you sleep without a pillow or you sleep on a hard pillow. Don't sleep on a soft That shows actually comfort. That shows, you know, uh, I'm not really serious about my commitment to Christ. Then, sell your musical instruments. Don't eat, you know, the soft white bread. Instead, eat the wheat bread, you know, the hard ones. The tasteless ones. With that, you cannot. If you are sincere you know, about obeying Christ, take warm baths. Okay? Warm baths means you are actually out of out of God's favor. You see, and you definitely cannot shave your beard. Why? Because see, God created us with beard, right? And beard not normally naturally grows out. So if you are shaving your beard, you are actually working against the God who created us this way. See. So you, are you trying to improve his work? No. God made you and you're good. So you should leave the beard to grow by itself. So which means, you know, that wild look will come. But that's how you should do it. Then she asks this question. Does this answer sound absurd? Then she answers us saying, undeserving, yet unconditional love. You know where she got this? She says she got this from second century theologians. This question was asked by a young man and uh, the second century theologians gave him this answer. Okay. Now the question is, 21st century, if you ask Christians, you give this list and say, does this look holy enough? And you'll be surprised. Many of them would say, yes. And if you go even some steps more also and say, let's make it even more harder. <laughs> no. The foolishness, she says, and Elizabeth Elliot says, the foolishness of trying to please, you know, uh, please God by keeping man-made rules and legalistic regulations. The foolishness of trying to please God by keeping man-made rules and legalistic regulations. Undeserving, yet unconditionally loved. That's what we are. Even if you do all these things, you're not going to win God's favor. And because we have won God's favor, we don't have to do all these things. It's already there. Favor is with us. So if you sleep on a hard pillow, will God be saying like, oh my dear child is sleeping on a hard pillow, so I will love him more? No. He loves you as much as he loves Jesus. Even now, right? So we don't have to do all these things. And we don't have to keep all these you know, foolish things. Now let's go to the Old Testament. This Old Testament story, I think some of you might be knowing it, but let me just tell you. See, like Paul, 
the story actually highlights okay like paul we are also undeserving and we are also unqualified yet we are unconditionally loved by the father for i said uh, week before last i said for true maturity to come people must give room for other people to grow how do you give that you give them room to fail you allow them you know like a child when he learning how to walk he falls then he gets up and he walks and you you pull him up maybe once or twice and then you allow him to fall again then he gets up and he learns to keep his step and then he learns to balance himself and then what happens then you allow him to make his own decisions where does he want to walk and go maybe he wants to go to the kitchen maybe he wants to go to the front room let him do that so and when he goes outside we'll say ah, be careful don't go there step is there you'll fall down see and once he falls down he will never go that way you see or he will learn to go the right way he, i've seen children you know who want to go down the stairs they will actually sit down and crawl down okay step by step they'll go but they will learn they will learn to master it and once you are once you understand that they are doing that they are safe you see so you have to give them opportunities to fail they'll get up and they will grow they'll become mature they'll start thinking for themselves they can make decisions they will not operate in fear you know some people they operate always in fear are you all the time is it down and they don't have any joy in their lives see? because they don't think they don't make decisions they don't operate they always operate in fear they always live in without joy see they are stunted christian they will never grow if you want mature christians you have to allow them to make mistakes and then to grow up and to grow up now always remember god delights in choosing those you know who are most unworthy and making them objects of his unconditional acceptance that's what god does and let's look at this example of god's grace you'll find it in second samuel chapter 4 and verse 4 second samuel 4 and verse 4 jonathan the son of saul had a son who was crippled in his feet he was 5 years old when the news about saul and jonathan came from jerusalem and his nurse took him up and fled and as she fled in her haste he fell and became lame and his name was mephi boshet okay a mephi boshet is a person who is when he was 5 years old you know uh, his father and jonathan uh, his father was jonathan and uh, his grandfather saul they both died in in the war saul committed suicide and jonathan was killed and as soon as this news came they were the king they were the people of the dynasty okay uh, saul's kingdom saul was the first king of israel at that time uh, you know they they were this was these were like brutal times so what happens is if a, if a king dies the successor the person who is going to come up as the next king he would wipe away all the relatives of the previous king or the previous dynasty okay now here david was coming to power and this lady was actually saving this boy by by mistake by an accident she, the boy fell down when he, they were escaping and he got both his legs crippled he was not born a cripple but he his got his both legs crippled he became lame okay so that was a tragedy that happened when he was escaping now what happened is uh, fast forward you know uh, 15 to 20 years you come to second samuel chapter 9 and you'll find that now david David has actually become king he is an undisputed king now uh, he has got everything under his command and the control and his whole family is now revel- living in in the king's castle and he is being uh, you know he is he is now the ruling king and as he is sitting on his throne one day he is just looking back at his life and all the people who did good things for him now all his journey from that shepherd boy right up to that king point you know and how god has been so faithful and how god used some faithful friends so that he could reach that point and suddenly his thought goes back to jonathan okay his thought goes back to jonathan what did jonathan do actually it happens in first samuel chapter 20 if you keep a finger here and let's go back to first samuel chapter 20 and first samuel chapter 20 was 13 to 17 you'll see that jonathan and uh, david were good thick friends you know they they were joined together as uh, you know as god had joined two friends so one of the glorious friendships in the bible that you'd see and first samuel chapter 20 was 13 to 17 they make a promise to each other you know verse 17 and jonathan made david swear again by his love for him for he loved him as he loved his own soul see, see these two guys loved each other so much 
that they make a promise to each other they will help each other or their descendants okay if one of them is alive and the other is not alive the other one will take care of his descendants okay so that's the kind of you know uh, friendship that these two guys shared and jonathan actually protected david many times from saul himself his own father okay so these all these good memories about jonathan comes flooding into his mind and he says i have done anything for jonathan and his family and david wants to do something for them he says and david says come to second samuel chapter 9 verse 1 and david said is there still anyone left of the house of saul that i may show him kindness for jonathan's sake wow that's a good question that he came to you know now david is remembering to show kindness for whose sake for jonathan's sake now the word here that is used for kindness is the same that is used in the king james bible for loving kindness the same hebrew word you know that is the word is called chest c h e s t d chest chest is the word that actually has been translated as mercy chest is the word that has been translated as loving kindness grace all these three words come from this root word hebrew word called chest in the old testament okay? now David showed so much of grace to David. I mean, God showed so much of grace to David, and David wanted to show grace to someone from Saul's family. For whose sake? Again, for Jonathan's sake. So jo- David wants to demonstrate to someone in Saul's family what he has received unconditionally from God, His grace. So, sorry, my bad. So the question is not. in Saul's family is there somebody deserving no there is nobody deserving is there anybody who is qualified no there is no one qualified is there anyone that is brilliant and sharp intellectually physically handsome or you know healthy or powerful strong that david can actually promote into his army is there anybody like that no david is not asking like that david is saying is there still anyone left of the house of Saul that i may show him kindness for jonathan's sake the question is is there anyone okay and they bring the servant called ziba and they ca- called him to david and the king asked him are you ziba he said yes and the king asked is there not still someone of the household of saul that i may show the kindness of god to him repeat same question ziba said to the king there is still a son of jonathan okay there is one guy but the problem is you know he is crippled okay so it is not a very open yes yes there is but crippled he is of no use so maybe ziba was protecting mithishabas because if david saw that he was healthy then he could be a threat to the kingdom you see some people might actually support him and make him king it don't happens like that also but here david should should not feel threatened about him so ziba may be trying to divert him and saying no but let's not think about it. he's totally crippled he can't do anything to us so it is not a bright yes he might be thinking a suspicious of david's you know grace but he's saying like you know uh, suddenly why should the king think about jonathan's sons saul's grandchildren you know why should he think about it why because maybe the king wants to wipe out even the last trace of saul's dynasty so he is not very much happy about it or he's trying to very much cover it up with he's a crippled okay let's not go that way because it's not worth it pursuing that guy but then come to verse 4 the king said to him where is he and ziba said to the king he is in the house of makir the son of amiel at lodibar lodibar if you look at the map it's far away from where king david is right now and lodibar actually the word means barren place it actually literally means no place of pasture no greenery it is a barren land it's a wasteland this boy is just hiding in a god forsaken place nobody would think about going there you know that kind of a horrible place he is living in anonymity he is living in isolation maybe nobody knows exactly where he is but he is in that land the barren place in directly saying he is in the wilderness so this is the condition of this person mephibosheth when david inquired about him Then what does David do? David goes searching after him. He said, "Go find him. Bring him here." No excuses. Nothing about him being crippled. Nothing about where he is staying. He said, "Go and find him and bring him." That's all. 
So this man did not want to be found. You know, he was hiding in a remote place. Now, he really thought that if King David found him out, he would definitely be killed. So he was trembling when his people came there. And then uh, he did not know for what the king wanted him, but he came there and immediately he fell at David's feet. And then he asked for forgiveness. He said, please show me. You know, Behold, I am your servant. And David said to him, do not fear. First thing David told him was, do not fear. Fear not. You know, thousands of years later, Jesus would walk throughout Galilee, throughout Capernaum, throughout this region, the son of David. You know, one of the most favorite phrases that Jesus always told his people when they came to him, fear not. Fear not. I'm not here to kill you. I'm not here to finish you. I'm not here to judge you. Fear not. This was one of the most used phrases of Jesus, the son of David. And David used that towards Mephibosheth. He said what? Fear not. Now, I'm not here. I'm not going to you know, look down at you. I'm not going to you know, swing my cricket bat at you and punish you. No, that is not why you have been brought here, Mephibosheth. So there is no deep frown. There is no bullying. There is no demanding. Nothing is asked of Mephibosheth. Just open arms and words that are dripping with comfort. Words that are dripping with grace. What did she say? David says, do not fear for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. And I will restore you to you all the land of Saul, your father, and you shall eat at my table always. You shall eat at my table always. See, David does not even know this man's character. He's just met him now. But for the sake of Jonathan, he's just forgiving all that he is. He's just ignoring all that and he's saying, you're going to live in my castle and you're going to eat at my table. Everything that Saul had will be restored to you. Amazing, right? Four times David says, you'll eat at my table. Verse 7, verse 10, verse 11, and verse 13. Four times David says, you will eat at my table. Okay? Now you have to picture this scene, right? He falls at his feet and David says, no, 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 no. I'm going to show you kindness. I'm not going to ask you what kind of a person you've been, what you've been doing all these 15 years, where you've been hiding and all those things. I'm not going to ask you anything. You're just going to be treated like one of my own children. And I'm going to be there at the table eating with my children and I want you to be there on that table also. So you can imagine, you know, when the table is set and the cooks will be calling, you know, the assistant, the attendants will be calling everybody and saying, lunch is served. And there comes David, you know, the head of the family, and he sits on his, his main chair. And on the right side, you will find Absalom, uh, his handsome son. And then you will find, uh, you know, uh, Amnon and Tamar and all his children. And Solomon will be there. His favorite son will be sitting there at the right hand of the father. You know, all of them will be seated there, but they can't start the dinner or lunch. You know why? Because somebody has to come. And then they will see from far away, you know, the curtain will move. And out comes this man, you know, wearing holding these crutches and he'll be doing clump, clump, clump. You know, he'll just plod and come and drag his feet and he'll come and come and slowly, you know, everybody will be waiting for him. He'll come and take his seat at the table and the tablecloth will cover his lame legs, crippled legs and then he is one among the children. One among David's own. He's part of the family now. And then they will have food together. You know? This is what's happening. Now, in this story, we see grace. Through and through, we see grace. I'm going to just show you eight analogies of grace and we'll stop there. First of all, once Mephibosheth enjoyed this kind of treatment, you know, with his own father, they were royalty. You know? So at that time, they had undeserving, unconditional, you know, he could actually come to the table and eat whatever he wanted. So same way, we also, the original couple, you know, Adam and Eve, they had an unbroken relationship with God. In the garden, they had this fellowship with the Father. Right? So same way, Mephibosheth, one time he had this royalty. He was part of the family. But then what happened? Disaster struck. Right? And then fear came. Adam went into hiding. God came searching for him and called him, Adam, Adam, where are you? The same way Mephibosheth fell and he ran for his life and he was hidden for many, many years. You know, He could not, be, he could not come back to the future palace. Palace, he could not come back to his old royal lifestyle. No. When sin came in, humanity suffered, and all that we had 
we lost and we were left permanently crippled on earth why because of sin because of sin in our lives so, and we were afraid to come back to god why because we knew we were guilty and david the king what did he do he showed out of his unconditional love for his beloved friend jonathan he sought out this one person to whom he might show grace and loving kindness and the same way god the father because of his unconditional acceptance of his one and only son's death on the cross he seeks anyone to whom he might extend his grace and then he finds you and finds me and he just chooses us he says let me show you grace let me give you my uh, my loving kindness because i have been satisfied by the death on the cross what my son did i am pleased with it my wrath has been done with now i want to show you grace just like how david showed jonathan his favor same way god because of jesus shows us his grace and fourth thing we find is the crippled man had nothing he did nothing and deserved nothing he didn't even try to win the king's favor by you know losing the crutch and trying to walk by himself no nothing all he could do was just lie down there and accept it same way we also are sinners we have no hope we are totally undeserving of any mercy we are not worth god's favor all we can do is fall down and humbly accept it then the king restored the cripple you know from his horrible existence he was somehow living there a place of barrenness and desolation and from there he has been restored to where fellowship and honor and the father has done the same thing for us also from our low debar our brokenness and our depravity from there he rescued us and he brought us to a place of spiritual nourishment and intimate closeness with him that's where we are right now the king restored the cripple my god has restored the sinful me now i am where i am in the place of fellowship and honor my old life of brokenness and depravity is gone from me then sixthly david made mephi mephi the part of his family royal family you know he gave him all the if solomon gets something mephi boshet also gets it every son or daughter is treated equally royally so he'll get food any time he wants he'll get food any time he wants a drink he will get it you no know, from uh, from cow's milk or camel's milk whatever he wants he will get it and everything that the king wants to bless his children with he is blessing mephibosheth also so we too have been adopted like sons and children daughters of god and we are his royal priest we are his family now so what happens whatever jesus gets we also will be getting we also are getting uninterrupted provisions nourishment blessings everything that jesus deserves now we also are getting thanks to him finally 7 and 8 the adopted son slim a constant reminder mephibosheth knows this is not his achievement there is nothing that he has got he is the king's grace so our imperfect situation our state right now should remind us that nothing has changed we are still sinful people but grace has abounded in our lives where sin abounds grace super abounds it's only by grace that we are still here so our limp has never left us constantly we remember okay that that habit still there my my ability to call bad names it's still there my short temper it's still there it's just that the holy spirit is keeping it under control so what happens grace super abounds i'm still here why because grace has super abounded and finally when mephibosheth just sat at the table he was treated as one of david's own sons no less than absalom or solomon when we feast one day at the royal table of our king of kings and lord of lords when the father is going to offer this feast for us jesus will be there but we will also be there as his own as his own so and that's what is going to happen to us so as we look to these eight analogies of grace let us remember that god has done it it is not us nothing that we have done we don't deserve this but his unconditional love has accepted us how by grace that's right 
Heavenly Father, as we look to you, help us to understand the depth, the width, and the height of this grace that has enveloped us. We were hiding in our Lodi bar, meaningless existence, in our depravity, in our sins. Totally, Lord, not capable of coming towards you. But you sought us out. You searched and found us. And you brought us into your family. One by one, you brought us into your family. And you seated us at the royal table. And you treat us just like your son. What a privilege. What grace. No wonder John Newton sang that song and said, Amazing grace. Sweetest sound. That saved a wretch like me. A cripple like me. An undeserving lost, lost case like me. You have saved us. By all grace. Help us to Help us live under this grace. Help us to cherish this grace. Not to live in fear. We give you praise and we give you glory. In Jesus' name. Amen.